Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our preparedness technology talk on Get Smart on Information Sharing Standards for Mutual Aid and Crisis Management. I'm just going to do a quick sound check to confirm. Um, Mary, are you able to hear me loud and clear? Yes, I am. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all very much for joining us today, uh, September 5th, for our next Prep Tech Talk. To get started, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items. All questions and answers will be addressed uh, within the question and answer feature within the Zoom platform. So you're welcome to put in any questions as they come up, and we will attempt to take uh, several of those questions during uh, the session as well as at the end of the session, which allows for a bit more time for Q&A. Excellent. So just a really quick recap in terms of our objectives for today's session. We're going to cover uh, the basics on existing information sharing standards that apply specifically to mutual aid resource management and crisis management technology systems. We recognize that there's many other information sharing standards out there and um, joined with me today is Mary Koch, uh, one of our partners with Ardent MC, and she's going to actually share more about uh, how many different standards there are and what that process is. We're also going to learn why it's critical to ensure that your systems are interoperable and capable of seamless information exchange among agencies and response partners certainly on a need-to-know basis and as is appropriate for your agencies and missions. We'll help you develop some skills on how to guide your technology vendors and partners in implementing the most appropriate information sharing standards for resource management and crisis management technology systems. And we'll give you the information to gain access to the latest version of our implementation guidance so that you can begin working with your agency and your region and your partners to have a game plan on how to improve interoperability and enhance your mutual aid op operations through better information sharing. So just a really quick uh, recap on our agenda today. We'll cover some introductions on our end, uh, organizational background, and then we will go through uh, some background on, on an overview of mutual aid and information sharing. Then we'll invite uh, one of our guest experts, Mary Koch with Ardent MC to cover uh, some background in terms of the process for defining, reviewing, and assessing relevant standards. We'll then cover a recap on the select standards for information sharing that we've identified and built into the implementation guidance. And then we'll talk a little, bit about, a little bit about how to incorporate your technology strategy and procurement uh, process uh, with those standards. And we'll leave some time for questions and answers. So for those that are new to us, just to get started, uh, my name is Rebecca Harnett. I'm the Director for National and Federal Programs with the NAPSIG Foundation. And uh, we, our vision as an organization is that our emergency responders and leaders are equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome for survivors. So we are a 501c3 not-for-profit established almost 20 years ago, and we have grown into a network of over 20,000 members representing public safety leaders, first responders, and GIS practitioners from across the different disciplines, state, local, tribal government, uh, the, the critical infrastructure sectors, and the private sector as well. We are governed by a board of directors that is also comprised of public safety and emergency management industry leaders. And we were originally formed almost 20 years ago as an alliance between all the different associations that you see represented here, ranging from emergency management to fire service, city county management, uh, law enforcement, uh, and a variety of other organizations as well. So in terms of our focus, we are very much focused on the local needs, but have a national reach as an organization. Uh, so I already covered some background, but the 
the map that you see here on the screen actually shows you the geographic distribution of the participants that are joined with us today uh, for this virtual training session, Prep Tech Talk. You can see pretty even distribution from across the country. And then you can even see the breakdown by discipline and then also by sector or level of government with a vast majority representing local government which is certainly our focus as well, uh, but you can also see the other areas uh, pretty well represented. So where our, our vision and our mission is focused is from preparedness through response and into recovery. So that in that full spectrum of capability and how we enable first responders, operators, and decision makers to ensure they have access and know how to use the right actionable information at the right time. And this really is at the crux of why we have gone on this mission of developing the implementation guidance on information sharing standards. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. So how we do what we do um, at our foundation as an organization uh, and our, our bedrock, so to speak, is the development and promulgation of national guidelines and standards. So that's something we've been doing for almost the last 20 years, identifying those best practices from across the nation, and in some cases internationally, and then clearly defining and documenting those in the forms of national guidelines and standards. We also conduct uh, a variety of different exercises in simulation to foster regional collaboration and understand implementa implementation successes as well as challenges so that we can work with you all together as a community to mature our respective capabilities. And then we also conduct and provide a variety of different education and training opportunities, such as the virtual session we're having here today, as well as some live in-person workshops, our national summit, uh, to be able to help support building this capability across the nation. And then certainly last but not least, but this is the least uh, focus of ours, but we do provide some technical assistance to different agencies from time to time to really enable that transference of knowledge and skills uh, when and where it matters most. So just as a point of reference, you can all gain access to all of our resources that we have available, ranging from those guidelines and templates, the education and training, our symbol library tool, a variety of other toolkits uh, that we support uh, right through our website. So you can go to knapsigfoundation.org and then hit the resources tab right there on the top and it'll bring you here. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and move into you know, what is mutual aid and ensuring all the participants have a common baseline understanding of what we're talking about when we sit, when we talk about mutual aid and, and crisis management. So mutual aid is the sharing and movement of resources that can involve personnel, teams, task forces, even facilities, equipment and supplies from one entities to another entity. And deployment of resources can involve the physical deployment or movement, or the virtual sharing of a resource at a distance. Typically, agreements, be, that, be it an MOU, an MOA, a compact, whatever different form those agreements may take, are generally used to establish the terms under which one party provides resources to another party. In our nation today, as I'm sure many of you are already familiar, there's a pretty broad spectrum of mutual aid. Sometimes we may not consider the aid that we either give or receive to a neighboring agency or entity to be mutual aid. We may call it things like automatic aid. And that happens generally 80 to 90% of the time. Uh, there's many communities in, in our nation today that rely on that automatic aid for many, many incidents every single day. It's how they perform their daily operation. And then for larger scale events that have not escalated into being major emergencies or states of disaster, uh, that's typically referred to as maybe local county or tribal mutual aid that could be a broader level of agreement among multiple jurisdictions within a given county or between different tribal nations 
or simply between different localities across a, a state. And then as an incident scales and becomes more complex, typically there are larger scale uh, mutual aid requests and deployments such as regional, interstate, and statewide mutual aid prior to or for incidents that have not received any type of a disaster declaration. And then there's also the movement of resources, um, also referred to as interstate mutual aid, specifically after a declaration, and that could be a governor declared state of emergency. And as you can see, as that type of mutual aid scales um, in terms of its level, it, the frequency that it's required certainly uh, minimizes. And that's an important note. And then, of course, there is international mutual aid that are many of our departments that are along border communities engage with as well. So just a really quick uh, recap for those that may not be familiar, this whole mission around, around mutual aid and crisis management is governed by national doctrine and guidance that is provided to the community but also developed by the community from FEMA. So I provided here just a really quick recap. Your, our core doctrine that we rely on uh, to guide us on this is the National Incident Management System. And then within NIMS, there's a whole component focused on resource management. Uh, and there's some specific guidance within that doctrine there uh, for truly effective mutual aid operations across the nation and as events scale into, into catastrophic level events. And within NIMS, there's something called the Resource Typing Program, which I'll talk about momentarily, as well as the National Qualification System. And they're supporting National Qualification System doctrine, as well as um, position qualification sheets and uh, task books. And further supporting that is a NIMS uh, guideline for resource management preparedness. And then as well, there's the NIMS guideline for mutual aid specifically. So if you wanna dive deeper, the slide deck that we're using will be provided afterwards and it will include links to all of these resources for you. So just a really quick uh, synopsis on resource typing because it's core to how we understand information sharing of resource management information. So resource typing, describes the minimum qualifications for personnel, equipment, teams, and units for consistent uh, types of resources. So FEMA and releases these position qualification sheets and these resource typing definitions. And it's this common name and the common definitions of these capabilities that actually helps to drive interoperability of understanding what resources one jurisdiction is requesting and then what another jurisdiction is deploying or providing to meet that need and requirement. All of FEMA's resource typing documents are available on the resource typing library tool, so you can go to the link here to see that. And there's also an API available, that's an application programming interface, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes, that does use open information sharing standards that you can actually integrate into your resource management, mutual aid and crisis management systems to help achieve better interoperability with those NIMS resource typing definitions. So I won't get too far into this, but we did want to ensure there's a baseline understanding of what we're talking about with personnel qualifications and the national qualification system, otherwise referred to as the NQS, which also provides a common language and approach for qualifying and certifying deployable emergency personnel. So this NQS is, is specific to people and positions, whereas the resource typing definitions are focused more on those equipment teams and task forces. So there's a variety of different components and tools that help support that implementation of the NQS. The important thing for today's session though to acknowledge is that the definitions for those position qualification sheets and how we title them and understand their capabilities helps to support that interoperability, that common language for the sharing of personnel through mutual aid and crisis management systems. 
Another term commonly uh, referred to in this space is something called mission ready packages. And it's important to acknowledge that mission ready packages are not equivalent to NIMS resource typing. MRPs are intended to be based on and are the next logical step after NIMS resource typing. Oftentimes, a mission ready package will include additional components such as prescripted mission statements, limits, the, the costs associated with the deployment of those resources. And I'll show some graphics here in just a little bit. But I do want to mention here that templates for mission ready packages are available through the Emergency Management Assistance Compact EMAC, which is linked here. It's important to acknowledge that these are all parts of a greater system and unification of mutual aid. So this next slide provides a graphic for you of understanding you've got your resource typing doctrine and your national qualification system. And then you've got in your local agency, an inventory potentially or a database of how you know what equipment you have, what teams you have, what task forces, facilities, and which personnel you have that you might want to make available for deployment through any type and level of mutual aid. When an agency, be it a, a larger scale uh, agency or a state agency, decides that they want to form a mission ready package, they typically combine those individual personnel equipment teams and facilities into what's called a mission ready package and they associate a cost specifically with that package to understand for mutual aid of a whole package what would that be so you can see how certainly this can align to different levels of mutual aid and it's important to acknowledge that we oftentimes at the local level we will request and deploy certain pieces of equipment, uh, be it a, an, an ambulance or a pumper or one other piece of equipment um, or a small team through in our daily operations, our automatic aid and our local aid. But as events scale in complexity and scope, we often need to go through that process of mission ready packaging our resources. So why information sharing standards and, and how does it apply to this whole ethos of mutual aid and resource management? Well, achieving these objectives that we set forth today and for this mission of mutual aid requires us to share resources and situational awareness information in alignment with interoperable standards and formats. Prior to and during an, an event, planners and decision makers, operators and responders they need to have a shared and common understanding of what resources and capabilities are available when and where across those different organizational and jurisdictional boundaries. And we certainly know that this is the case right now as we are deep in the trenches in supporting Hurricane Dorian response. But we also need this information, not just in our response phase, but also in our planning phase during clear skies, blue skies. We need to be able to identify potential shortfalls and capability gaps through our planning and our exercises and focus on establishing those mutual aid agreements to prepare for potential shortfalls and gaps. But in order to do that, we need to be able to understand what resources and what information is available across those jurisdictional boundaries. Our entire mutual aid network, which spans the, the nation as a whole, in essence, can be an integrated and unified network of mutual aid systems, enhancing our nation's overall preparedness and resilience, allowing us to account for order, request, and mobilize resources as efficiently and effectively as possible. So there's a, there's a variety of other resources out there that we've developed to help build on the development of this implementation guidance that we wanted to ensure you all have visibility of and are able to use and access. But our focus today is going to be on this, the last uh, resource bolded here, the implementation guidance on information sharing standards for crisis management systems. So with that, I have the opportunity to introduce Mary Koch with Arden MC. And at the start of developing this implementation guidance, we um, commissioned a study to Ardent MC to help us define out what those specific 
most relevant standards are for mutual aid and crisis management systems. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Mary. Great, thanks Rebecca. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So my team was called upon mostly because Arden has a long history working within the emer emergency management community with DHS. Um, we've done a lot of work to not only look at the standards, but also help develop standards as well. So uh, this was a great opportunity for us to work with NAPSIG and further that uh, education with the standards that we have been working with, help to develop, um, and some of the work that we had done for DHS from a technical perspective. So essentially, uh, NAPSIG came to us and said that we, it would be great for us to go through an, uh, a standards catalog and put together some kind of implementation implementation guidance for the mutual aid community, um, looking for ways to better share data and make sure that systems were interoperable within the mutual aid community. So we were looking for uh, standards that would help support the share and exchange of information seamlessly in real time and across all the systems within the mutual aid and crisis management operations. Um, we also were looking to provide a guide that would help anybody within local, county, state, tribal um, to make decisions as far as technical procurement was concerned. Um, so not only identifying the standards that are important, but how would you use those standards specifically in your own areas? And how would you then ask for that when you were trying to procure um, different technical software capabilities to be able to share that data amongst either yourselves or other people within the mutual aid community. Next slide. Great. So we went about this. The, the great thing about my team is, again, we have that history within the standards community. So we already had a number of standards that we had been working with with emergency management personnel at DHS, but we went through the, an initial search online of what standards were available using certain keyword searches, um, mutual aid, crisis management, a CAD, uh, those kinds of uh, labels, along with the word data involved, because we were most concerned with data. We want to be able to share that data between two systems and make sure that they have a strong uh, common basis between them so that there isn't a lot of extra money involved, there isn't a lot of extra uh, work involved to get that system set up to be able to be used uh, in a large emergency situation. So after we did that initial search, we came up with a list of 26 different standards that seemed to apply to those search queries that we were using. Um, a lot of them were, again, uh, standards we had used previously that were familiar to us, and then there were several others that did come up that we hadn't worked with yet, or um, you know, might have been further defined or further worked on over time. So it was a great opportunity for us to take a look at that again after all the work that we've been doing uh, with DHS and sometimes with NAPSEG too. So after we did that initial search, we started doing a breakdown of what, what were we really looking for. So like I said before, we were looking for actual data standards so that we could provide that basis for system to system interoperability. So we went through the, the activity of removing the non-data standards. So to give you an idea of what the difference is, non-data standards uh, tend to provide requirements and guidance on issues of policy and procedure, which is great. Um, both non-data and data standards do that, but what the data standards do is they specifically represent what the form of the share, uh, shared information needs to be. So when you're looking at system-to-system -system interoperability, you want that form to be uniform so that the data is more easily shared. And like I said, there's not a lot of customization involved with using those uh, technical software products. So after we removed the non-data standards, we went through the activity of looking more closely at what kind of mutual aid, mutual aid in information was most important. So we did go to the Mutual Aid Information Requirements Summary Report, which Rebecca just showed the link for, and picked out the core data requirements so that we could further eliminate the standards. 
So I have these on the slide. I'll run through them very quickly. So the two major things when you're looking at sharing mutual aid information um, from system to system is you want a lot of information concerning if, if situational awareness and then resource management. So like Rebecca was talking about earlier, obviously all of that information concerning the resource is very, very important. So we broke that down to five different areas, resource kind type, resource availability, deployment time, resource cost, resource readiness. From situational awareness, we're looking at event scale, event forecast prediction, event magnitude, demographic trends, and critical infrastructure impact. So we went through the activity, and this, this document is something that uh, NAPC now has. If you, have, if you want more information or you want to look at this more closely, we went through the activity of taking every standard and putting that against these 10 areas of core data requirements. Um, and we would look at you know, all of the information involved with how that data is formed and which areas this actually ticked off. So, as you can imagine, there is not one standard that hits all of these areas. Um, I, I don't know if that's even possible, and I don't know if that would be useful over time because you know each area is looking for something a little bit different. So we had to come up with a list, essentially, that was the standards that hit as many of these areas as possible. Um, so we went through that opera, uh, that activity and we identified the standards that support interoperability to the best of their ability and hit all of these areas. So we came up with a much shorter list after that and also identified several areas where it would be helpful if more standards were developed. Um, one of those areas is definitely resource cost. I wouldn't say that there's a lot of great standards outside, out there that support that. Um, we certainly have a lot with situational awareness, uh, resource kind type, things like that, but resource costs is one of the areas where it would be great if we could find more. Um, so next slide. So this is the list of the standards that we came up with that we felt actually hit all of those areas that were important to the mutual aid or data. So um, most of these came from OASIS, the Organization for the Advan Advancements of Structured Information Standards. Um, like I said before, we had, uh, as a team, worked with OASIS to identify some of these standards and to help develop them over time um, using our technical knowledge. And so a vast majority came out of the Emergency Data Exchange Language, the Excel suite of standards. So that included the common alerting protocol, which I'm sure you've all heard of. So um, you would use cap messaging in, in situations like iPods when they're sending out alerts uh, based on some kind of incident. The hospital availability exchange, that's hospital information. Distribution element is uh, actually, it's, it's far more technical, I would guess, than the others and a little bit harder to explain, but this this essentially gives the developer the ability to determine how to form that message to be able to send that information back and forth between two systems. Uh, resource management, that gives a lot of that resource management information that we were talking about earlier. And then the situation report, which is situational awareness information. Um, we also were working primarily, a lot of things came out of the national information exchange model. Um, my team did develop the emergency management loose coupler, which is another, uh, I, I guess a, a standard is a little bit of a strong word, but it's another way to form the data and actually make it a little bit lighter weight, um, which when you're thinking about things uh, traveling back and forth digitally, you don't think that it has to, that weight would matter very much, but it certainly does. And so this was something that we had developed that allows for some of this data to be wrapped in such a way that it doesn't hold up or have issues with network problems, connectivity, things like that. Great. So on to the next slide. So after we came up with a list of data standards that we felt would be most applicable to, to this group, we went through the um, the activity of putting together an implementation guide. So what we wanted to do, like I said before, is provide 
information to people who are making decisions, not only from a leadership perspective, but also from a technical procurement perspective, so that they could go out and know what they needed to be able to share that information well and keep costs down and ensure customization maybe wasn't needed. So I think we're all probably aware as a group of when you order software, you know, you hear a lot of really great things from the company selling that software, but inevitably, once you really start getting down to the nitty gritty with them, so to speak, you find out that there's a lot of customization involved for that software product to be stood up and actually useful for you. So we went through the activity of identifying and coming up essentially with uh, workflows that we hoped would help people who were not terribly technical be able to go through the activity of saying, this is what I need in my system and, and just coming to the table a lot more informed when you're dealing with that company who's selling that software or, or you're even setting it up yourself for whatever reason, you wanna make sure that you are asking for the right thing. So which data standards are we using? Which elements are the most important to us? And that in turn will allow us to go back and pick those standards that we had identified as probably the most useful for this group. So if for instance, you're very interested in hospital information, you're transporting a lot of uh, patients over to different hospitals, maybe for some reason in your area, there's a number of different hospitals. Some are known to be quite available, others aren't. Um, that might be an area where you would want to focus which data elements you're interested in using for your implementation of whatever software you're trying to put in. Um, then we went through the activity of looking at how to send data and elements. So that's essentially the communication protocol of MQTT or HTTP. Um, this doesn't sound like it's, it's really important, but at the end of the day, it is. So if you're in a particular community that primarily uses MQTT, you want to make sure that you're ordering a system that also uses that so that you don't have to, again, go through that customization piece or find out that the software that you chose to purchase actually doesn't work with that. Um, highly unlikely, probably, um, just about any software company will tell you that they can go ahead and make those changes as needed. But, um, but certainly it's, it's really important to be thinking about that. And if you have limited funds to spend, you wanna make sure that you're spending them in the right way. And then where and how to have systems communicate. So again, the use of API, like Rebecca was talking about a little bit earlier, uh, making sure that you have the right API, that you are using um, whatever standard is the basis for the API that maybe the other groups in your area are using. Um, that, that's also very important when you're going, to ha going ahead and picking which system is best for you. So um, I highly recommend definitely going through this uh, guide. It goes into a lot more detail than I was able to of how to choose the data elements, which are the most important for you and your system. Um, it also goes through a lot more information concerning the communication protocols and why you would choose what you would choose. Um, and then some information on the APIs that you would eventually pick. So those workflows will allow you to kind of answer the questions easily and, and essentially uh, build your own or choose your own best system approach. I think that's the end of my slides, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think that is. Thank you so much, Marie. This is really helpful. Um, and just I think for the benefit of other folks, uh, as a part of that, standards inventory and review process uh you all did a review of uh, you know probably well over 20 or 30 different standards including some that came out of other standards development organizations such as ANSI and NFPA and a number of other ones is that correct mm -hmm. yeah that's correct we did find some others unfortunately those were not they were either not uh actual data standards or they really didn't support what we were talking about earlier, which was uh, the formation and makeup of the data. So, so we had to pull some of those out, unfortunately. Great, well, this has been a really helpful recap. And I think this approach of the workflows uh, in, in defining and providing that choose your own best, um, best standard and systems approach is really helpful. And we'll be talking more about that in the next segment. I did want to take an opportunity, since I know you are going to have to jump off a couple of minutes early, if folks do have any questions for Mary and what she's covered in terms of 
the process of reviewing standards and then helping to develop this implementation guideline, please feel free to put your questions um, in the Q&A and we will work on getting those answered for you. Well, thank you again, Mary. We truly appreciate uh, the partnership on this effort. And um, I know more is to come and we've got more work to do in, in order to, um, to move this forward. So continuing, I'm gonna cover uh, select information sharing standards that are in the implementation guidance. Um, so uh, really quickly, all of this guidance can be found here. This is what the cover of the guidance looks like, and the link is provided right here for easy access. So the most relevant standards, as uh, Mary covered, are, are listed here. I will go back through those again. I will touch on some of them as we talk through the other the next few slides, uh, but this is in essence the ones that were identified to support the greatest level of uh, interoperability for information sharing uh, for mutual aid and crisis management systems. So in terms of that decision process, the first thing that we need to do, and, and this is particularly critical for folks that are joined with us today that are either perhaps fire chiefs or emergency managers or planners, is before you want to figure out which standards you want to use, you need to define your own information needs. So this chart kind of helps you say, all right, well, what's your information need? Is it situational awareness or is it resource management? And that can, and there's a chart down below here that helps to characterize some of that information. And that's a, a really key starting point in terms of using those workflows within the implementation guidance to finally identify which standards are most relevant to you for information sharing. So there's a suite of workflow questions for situational awareness as well as a suite of items characterizing resource management. But it's really about you defining your information need. And next I have, you know, this is a decision chart in terms of selecting that interoperable standard. And I will, uh, whoop, create this. Um, you can see here, it's that same construct of you've got your standards, you have your information need. Is it situational awareness, which is in the orange, or is it resource management? And as you drive through these different items, is it detailed event information? If yes, then you want, would like to use the CAP standard. If no, you would move on to general event information. If that's what you're looking for, you would use the SITREP standard. So you can follow these very simple decision charts, which are all in the implementation guidance to be able to help align and identify which of these different standards are apply to your needs and your requirement. Uh, and that may be multiple, as, as Mary mentioned, there's no one single standard that addresses all of these needs. It, and intentionally, there are separate standards that can be brought together uh, to support your technology development process. So first, I'm just gonna cover that workflow for situational awareness standards and give you a sense of this workflow. It, while it is a, a workflow, it's also fairly linear. As you can see, it's a simple yes, no, helping you to arrive at, if you identify your most relevant information around situational awareness, that this helps you to determine which standard is most relevant. There are some small gaps in standards, as you can see here, for detailed other infrastructure status, as well as for demographic trends. And we are working with the standards development organizations to address those needs. So an example, and I will just use the EDXL SITREP or Situation Report Standard of how this works together is, you know, if more high level summary event information is required, then this EDXL situational report standard is recommended. And here you can kind of see how that workflow works. You've got your first responder system, you know, either on the ground and field ops or at the fire station that reports that information to your CAD system that then shares that information to your emergency operations system. 
So this EDXL sit, sit rep standard would support that information flow at that different levels from the most local boots on the ground all the way on up to the EOC as it pertains to that summary event information. And then as we move from, from situational awareness information to resource management, you can see it's a different set of standards that applies and supports resource management. There are some uh, similarities in a couple of places, as you can see, both the emergency management loose coupler standard is reflected here, as well as the SIT rep re is reflected here. But this workflow is the same as it was for situational awareness, but for resource management. So if you're looking at the request information, the tasking, the location, depending on what you say yes to or no, then that would drive you into which is the most relevant standard for what you need. And it may in fact be a combination of a few or all of these standards for your system. So provided here also is an example of a standard ident identification and use case. And the one we'll look at is the EDXL resource management standard combined with the NEEM emergency management loose coupler. So if you're making a mutual aid request and responses are, requ and re are required, then depending on the duration of the required aid and formality of the aid request, either the EDXL resource management standard or the NEEM uh, emergency management loose coupler standard is recommended. And so you can see at both of these levels, and you would, in this case, we call it computer-aided dispatch, your resource management system or your mutual aid system may in fact be that dispatching system without calling it CAD. So understanding that it can have multiple names, but it does enable that bi-directional sharing of that resource information across those systems. So they're both allowing um, information around the status of that resource, uh, and they're not, you know, accounting for something, you know, say being available when it's not available, uh, and they're able to share and communicate as quickly and as real time as possible. And, it, it, and this standard in particular does support that real time communication uh, and helps that, you know, essentially that common operating picture basis to request and respond to emergencies when those resources are needed across jurisdictional boundaries, across agencies, across any level of entity that it may apply to. So the other piece we wanna talk about is um, getting a little bit deeper into this, uh, the static versus dynamic information and data sharing. Since this affects both situational awareness information and resource management information. Historically, we've had a tremendous amount of what we'd call static data sharing um, or a point in time sharing of information that could be on the fly. Um, some different formats that are common for that static data sharing are CSV, XML, KML. Um, you might see shape files, some of the more historic information. But when we talk about information sharing and standard data sharing formats for mutual aid and crisis management, where we need to keep our focus is on the sharing of dynamic data, um, APIs and web services, as Mary started to allude to earlier. There's a variety of different formats for those, uh, but what's important here is this provides you that real-time status and tracking of information. So as that information may change, it could be something on the situational awareness side, it could be something about a particular resource. Either, you know, every system that's consuming that information is able to see the most current information that is currently available to help drive decision making. So some different formats that are common for that dynamic data sharing are SOAP, REST, um, HTTP, JSON, and these, th this helps provide the maximum interoperability and operational benefit. So I'll share it with you in terms of open web standards a little bit as it relates to this. Um, support is growing amongst our community for the open web pattern allowing maps, crisis management systems, and related services to be 
authored and used by a wide spectrum of applications. And I think this graphic does a really nice job at providing that diversity and that at the different levels in where these open web standards and open and interoperable data formats come into play to be able to support the variety of uses that we rely on today to carry out our operations, be it you know, crisis management or specifically for mutual aid operations across all levels in that spectrum of mutual aid. So this helps provide kind of what are those op open and interoperable data formats for dynamic data sharing specifically. So within the implementation guidance, we have provided guidance around how systems can share and most of all, communicate. Uh, we need to improve that communication amongst those different systems, that sharing, to prevent the stove piping of our mutual aid and crisis management systems today. Understanding that we need to share both safely and appropriately as we're able to with good and substantial uh, data and information sharing policies, procedures, and governance structures. So in terms of communication guidance within the implementation guide, there is some workflows around understanding where you need to get to in terms of your communication methodology. And the real variation here is, you know, if it supports mutual aid and crisis management standards, you keep going and you determine, are you looking to share with a single system or are you looking to share with multiple systems? And that's really the differentiator between moving and looking at the HTTP workflow versus the MQTT workflow. So here we've got a variety of workflow questions that further supports understanding, you know, which communication methodology do you want to focus on using? So you can see in orange here and down below are your workflow questions for asking uh, around the HTTP and then as you look at the MQTT. Some of this does get a bit more technical in detail. Um, and, that's, and that's okay. A lot of the guidance that we've provided in this implementation guide uh, is not for technical um, users. However, we do provide some technical guidelines such as what you're seeing here so that you can work hand in hand with your technology partners and staff um, and your decision makers and operators to be able to navigate these somewhat challenging um, opportunities. So to kind of pull this all together for you, I wanted to provide just a overview of that systems to systems ethos of mutual aid and crisis management systems and that information sharing. So you can see here on the left hand side, you've got your different responder systems. These could be coming in from different agencies or levels of, um, of government. And they could be moving into a variety of different CAD systems, but depending on how that goes. And then in effect, sharing that information into whatever EOC system that may be applied, may apply for that particular uh, emergency support function or at that local agency, county agency, state, tribe, et cetera. And then it also ties in how your integrated alert and warning piece would tie into that, as well as perhaps your DOT systems on your private sector side. Perhaps you've got your energy and power plants and how that flows, as well as your hospitals, EMS, et cetera. So there's a variety of different systems to systems, and these different standards enable that sharing of information in a way that's safe and interoperable and allows for everyone to gain the access that they need around information, not necessarily to edit or modify that resource information, but to be able to see it to drive decision making. So in terms of what we can do to incorporate all these standards into your technology strategy and procurement process. So this first slide is really um, geared towards uh, emergency managers, fire chiefs, um, it, it could be you know, police chiefs, any discipline that's at that decision maker level. 
And the first thing that we encourage is for you to self-assess your information needs first. It's really easy to say, I need all information. Um, I need to see everything from everyone, but really kind of honing in on what information do you need to drive better decision-making, parsing that out between what information do you need just situational awareness, versus what is that resource management information? And then asking the question, who has that information? Is it somebody within a different department within your agency or within your jurisdiction? Or is it a neighboring jurisdiction if you are in a, say, a county mutual aid group or a regional mutual aid group? And then asking that question, if you have information that you know you need to help drive decision making, asking the question among who does my information need to be shared with? How will your agency and your mutual aid partners need to consume and use that information in their operations as well as in their planning? And then how do you need to analyze that information for decision making? Just being able to see, say, those resources or those fire engines or fire stations as dots on a map is one thing. But what are some of the metrics that you're actually going to use to guide your actual decision making around planning and shortfalls around actually anticipating resource needs and requests during a larger scale event. So it's really, it's on your end to determine what those thresholds are for your decision points and what metrics do you need to be able to make the best, most actionable uh, decisions when it matters most. And then once you've gone through that process, we encourage a self-assessment process around mutual aid um, or resource management systems. So if you already have a system, it's working with your team to answer some other questions. Um, does your system contain the information that you need? Perhaps there's some gaps that you need to address and then exploring where you can get the data or information to fill those gaps. And is that data and information available in interoperable dynamic formats? And then what information and data do you have in your system that would benefit your mutual aid partners if shared? And then to take it another step farther, it's also about asking your technology partners and vendors the right questions. If you're updating an existing system or perhaps you're considering the procurement of a new system or technology, it's really important to talk to your technology partners and vendors and asking them, frankly, some hard questions about how their technology supports or doesn't support information sharing standards. And you can use the workflows in the guide to help you understand which ones you need to be asking about based on what are relevant to you. But we've identified some additional questions here if you're focused on situational awareness for your system. You know, asking questions like, can you connect to live feeds? What data formats are, are acceptable for your, your technology and system? How easy is it to consume open data from other sources? Are you able to visualize and analyze that information? And as you drive into those resource management systems, uh, be it, you know, request and deployment, inventorying systems, et cetera. You know, asking some questions about how uh, data and resources are stored within that system, uh, about the file structures or database structures, about how you can load data into your system, what formats, and how you can ensure resources are aligned to, to the FEMA resource typing definitions and asking the questions around your database construction using those open standards that we talked about earlier. And last but not least on this topic is asking about information sharing. Um, does, does that vendor and technology partner, do they support bi-directional information sharing? If so, how easy is it? Are they able to make a live service or API quickly available and what's required to access and use that API? What are some of the rules around the usage? Does it apply interoperable standards? And do they publish web services? And if so, in what formats? So these are just some of the questions to help guide you. 
um, in that exploratory process of either upgrading or updating an existing system or procuring a new system. And last on this item is, you know, we're, is providing guidance. So you, even as the decision maker, while you may not speak the tech talk and you may not speak the standards talk, that's perfectly okay. But there's still opportunity for you to communicate what your needs and requirements are to your technology partners and vendors, not the other way around. Don't assume that your technology partners are up to speed on the latest interoperability standards for information sharing. As Mary talked about today, there are so many standards out there. There's so many systems engineering standards that everybody has to keep up with. And it, these standards that we're talking about um, that apply to mutual aid and crisis management are very specific to our public safety discipline and are not necessarily widely known by the technology community. That's part of the reason why we're doing this today. So the most important thing that you can do to communicate with your technology partners and vendors is to share and, and, and clearly convey to them the operational benefit and importance of developing the system to support interoperability. Understand that, that they know the business need and requirements for why you need to be able to seamlessly share information across agencies, jurisdictions, organizations, et cetera, and give them a copy of this guidance as a starting point. It includes detailed information at, at a very technical level that will help educate them and drive them into the right places. And when you're developing your RFPs for system upgrades or a new system, include specific requirements for development around interoperable standards and data API formats that are open and interoperable. Whether or not you need to fully use all of them at once, it doesn't matter, but what does matter is that it's scalable and flexible so that down the line as you add and build out your regional mutual aid sharing group, you're gonna have that flexibility that you need. So building to open standards and just supporting your team's information needs. So that concludes uh, the bulk of our session today. Um, we do encourage a few questions in the Q&A feature uh, within Zoom. I will answer some of those um, verbally as well as some in, in, in the Q&A following our session. But I did want to make you all aware of a couple of upcoming um, opportunities for some free uh, education and training opportunities. So we do have another prep tech talk scheduled for September 19th. Um, it is going to be uh, learning the latest in preparedness technology and tools. We have a really exciting panel of experts um, what, from local emergency management, state emergency management, and uh, FEMA that will be sharing with us some really amazing uh, new and emerging technology and tools available through Prep Toolkit. Additionally, um, November 12th to the 14th, uh, NAPSIG will be hosting the Innovation Summit for Preparedness and Resilience. So for those of you who joined us in the past for the National Geospatial Preparedness Summit, INSPIRE is uh, now the rebranded version of NGPS, and that will be held November 12th to the 14th at Texas A&M in Galveston. I do encourage you to make your travel plans and register quickly. Um, space is filling fast, uh, but we are really excited about both of these events and hope that you can join us. And you can follow this link here to be able to register for both the upcoming Prep Tech Talk as well as Inspire. So this is the events page. You can go here um, and click on the respective registration to register today. And with that, uh, this concludes our Prep Tech Talk uh, for today on Get Smart on Information Sharing Standards for Mutual Aid and Crisis Management. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is up here on the screen, rharnet at publicsafetygis.org. And below that is a link to the guidance. And lastly, I we will be sending everyone a copy of um, the link with the slide deck, as well as the recording from today's session within a day or so. So keep an eye out for that. And I just want to thank everyone very much for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.